Mali, the 11th of January, 2013. At the request of Malian authorities and the UN, France launched what would become the largest operation outside the coalition since the end of the war in Algeria. Named after the small African wildcat of the Sahel region, Operation Serval deployed more than 4,500 men and women. Their mission? To put a stop to terrorist-led attacks, restore Mali's territorial integrity, and protect some 5,000 French nationals. Operation Serval was a tremendous air-land campaign, a huge logistical challenge, and an incredible joint forces maneuver. Join us as we look back at the campaign with land forces and the Serval Brigade, based mainly on the 3rd Mechanized Brigade, the Mont Saber Brigade. Its motto, a single goal, victory. In 2012, terrorist groups took control of northern Mali, imposing Sharia law in the towns and cities that they conquered. On the 5th of January 2013, these groups coordinated their efforts and launched a vast offensive. A hundred heavily armed pickup trucks pushed their way south. Overrun and overcome by the insurgents' numbers, the Malian military retreated. The town of Kona fell on the 10th of January at 4 p.m. The road to Bamako was opened for the rebels. Nothing seemed to be able to stop them. I have therefore decided that France will intervene alongside our African partners at the request of the Malian authorities. It will do so strictly within the framework of United Nations Security Council resolutions and will be prepared to put a stop to the terrorist-led offensive should it continue. The declaration made by the French president opened the way for the special forces. Leading the way, the aircraft of their 4th helicopter regiment. The column of pickup trucks was stopped. First Lieutenant Damien Boiteux was hit while at the controls of his gazelle. He was the first French soldier to lose his life in Mali. That night, the first bombing missions began. The air campaign was first commanded out of N'Djamena and then from the Lyon Montverdun command center in France under the orders of General Borel. Guided by an Atlantic II aircraft from the Navy, French Air Force fighter planes launched bombs on vehicle columns and the terrorist rear positions. Despite the bombing campaign, the town of Diaboli was taken on the 14th of January. However, this victory would be their last. French forces in Chad and Côte d'Ivoire were placed on alert. In Bamako, the Malian capital, soldiers of the 2nd and 21st Marine Infantry Regiments and legionnaires of the 1st Foreign Cavalry Regiment arrived and prepared to enter the war. Together they formed an entity called Joint Tactical Group GTIA No. 1. The pressure is building for potential deployment. I've therefore been asked to be ready with my company at very short notice. That's why you see all the sections and marine infantry soldiers getting ready. Their bags are packed and when the order is given we'll be ready to take the field. I'm in command of an infantry company, so these are soldiers specialized in combat, either in armored vehicles or close combat in the field. Operation Serval faced its first challenge. 
It had to set up one of the largest independent intervention forces ever created in order to carry out an offensive as quickly as possible. As a result, incredible air movements were choreographed over the Malian capital. What? Tactical and strategic transport aircraft from metropolitan France and French bases in Africa came and went, bringing in military personnel and equipment. Back in France, Alert Guépard placed the military on alert. Alert Guépard is the French Armed Forces alert system. It enables the military to quickly deploy a complete and independent intervention force when a crisis occurs anywhere in the world. In this case, it was primarily made up of the 3rd Mechanized Brigade of Clermont-Ferrand and supported by units of the 9th Marine Infantry Brigade, the 11th Airborne Brigade and the Intelligence Brigade. In Toulon, AMX 10RC tanks of the RICM and armoured vehicles for infantry combat of the 92nd Infantry Regiment boarded the protection and command vessel Dixmude. It took army forces 10 days to arrive in Dakar, their first stop before reaching Mali. These units formed a joint tactical group, GTIA No. 2, under the command of Colonel Baer. These battalions are groups made up of several units offering additional know-how around a corps regiment. GTIA 1, commanded by Colonel Gez, was already on Malian soil. GTIA No. 3, mainly composed of the 1st Marine Infantry Regiment and under the command of Colonel Goujon, was brought in by air and pre-positioned in Niamey, Niger. Finally, GTIA No. 4, the paratrooper battalion commanded by Colonel Desmeules, was positioned in Abidjan, Côte d'Ivoire. The backbone of this GTIA was made up of paratrooper legionnaires of the 2nd Rep. In addition to these four battalions were aircraft from the Air Mobile Group, or GAM, under the orders of Colonel Gu, commanding officer of the 5th Combat Helicopter Regiment. At the same time, at the Bamako airport, fighter aircraft crossed paths with transport aircraft around the clock. The logistical challenge of Operation Serval was being met. An airborne surgical unit was brought in and set up. The ultra-modern field hospital was installed in one night. We've just found a building where we'll be able to install an operating room, a recovery room, a trauma resuscitation room and a hospital ward. Right now we're setting up the premises with the first priority being to create an autonomous operating room that is capable of receiving the first wounded. Roughly 10 allied countries provided support on various levels. They included Belgium, which deployed two helicopters that carried out several medical support missions throughout the campaign. But the period was especially marked by the arrival of the first elements of the AFISMA, the African-led international support mission to Mali made up of 15 African nations, with Chad committing the most personnel with a contingent of 2,400 men. While special forces continued their work to neutralize the adversary, Air Force Rafales, Mirage 2000Ds and F1CRs bombed enemy positions all the way to their rear bases. The situation stabilized and one of the first priorities was achieved, securing Markala, a strategic stronghold on the Niger River. On the 16th of January, the Serval Brigade joined the battle. A tactical subgroup of the 21st Rima arrived at this highly strategic point. Intelligence informed them of roughly a thousand rebels, making it a high-risk operation. Marine infantry soldiers positioned themselves on each side of the Niger River, determined to stop any rebel incursions. However, the enemy refused to engage in battle. 
GTIA No. 1 therefore received the order to continue on their way and retake the town of Diaboli. On the 17th of January, the mission was fulfilled and Diaboli was liberated. On the 21st of January, the command center for the Serval Brigade arrived in Bamako with its chief, Major General Barrera. It quickly became clear to the staff of the 3rd Mechanized Brigade that an operation needed to be launched on the symbolic city of Timbuktu. It would become Operation Oryx. Marine infantry soldiers of GTIA No. 1, guided by GAM helicopters, prepared a thousand-kilometer trek across the Malian desert. Vehicles and personnel suffered in a country twice the size of France, and the first problem they encountered involved logistics. Over a distance equal to that between Lille and Marseille, supplying food, mechanical parts and fuel was critical to the success of the operation. The logistics battalion and particularly the military fuel service accomplished the feat. They successfully carried out their complex mission and were present whenever and wherever they were needed throughout the operations. To avoid shortages, they transported precious fuel from Bamako to the front lines. While the column under the orders of Colonel Gers pushed on to Timbuktu, in Paris, the CPCO Planning and Operations Center decided to carry out a second joint operation to take back the city of Gao, 500 kilometers to the east. An armored column made its way to the city. In the air, soldiers of the 1st Airborne Infantry Regiment, also known as the Rapace, prepared an assault on the city's airport. Despite brief fighting with terrorist rear guards, the airport was captured and the city quickly retaken. The enemy fled, leaving behind many weapons and equipment. However, the news from Timbuktu was not good. General Barrera therefore ordered GTIA-1 to accelerate. He feared that they would arrive too late and decided to carry out a simultaneous operation, combining an armored raid and dropping paratroopers. In Abidjan, in Côte d'Ivoire, legionnaires of the 2nd Foreign Parachute Regiment preparing for an airborne operation that would be larger than any since the drop on Colvesi in 1978. As they boarded the aircraft, Colonel Desmeules paratroopers prepared to be dropped on Malian soil. At 11 p.m. on the 27th of January, GTIA-4 was dropped on the northern outskirts of Timbuktu, while armored vehicles of GTIA-1 seized the airport. The mission went off perfectly. Once again, the enemy fled, even though they'd still been in the area that day. News spread throughout the local population that the French had arrived. The soldiers of the Gers battalion entered the city under applause as its liberators. With the cities of Gao and Timbuktu retaken, French control of the Niger Bend was strengthened. They now had the task of establishing their presence and creating a real line of defense against any terrorist attacks. Si Papa 4 reçu, pour nous on reste en surveillance sur le même objectif. In Gao, the men of the 1st RCP secured the huge airport hub where command station G08 of the 11th Airborne Brigade was installed. However, pockets of resistance continued to sprout up and 81 mm mortars were used to remind insurgents that forces were present in the city. On the banks of the Niger River, legionnaires of the 1st REC deployed their Sage tanks for observation ready to stop any rebel counter-offensive attacks. In Timbuktu, zone control began, 
in order to create a security bubble around the city so that supplies could be brought in and operations prepared without any risk of terrorist attacks. A new air bridge had to be put in place. In Abidjan, a Hercules aircraft transported combat engineers and a bulldozer. They were airdropped on the Timbuktu airport. Within a day, the 2050 meter runway was cleared and reopened. The next day, the Armed Forces Chief of Staff, Admiral Guillot, accompanied by the Operation Serval Commander, General de Saint-Quentin, inaugurated the airport. Chapeau pour votre état d'esprit. I commend you for your attitude and your resilience, because I know that you were at the end of your tour in Chad. You went directly back to it. Well done, because all this is for the success of France's armed forces. Keep it up. Thank you, gentlemen. Partially destroyed by the rebels, the city was left with no water or electricity. The brigade worked to solve the problem. We're working on putting a water production system back in place for the force. That's why we need to find a pump and get it working again. However, air transport remained the main solution to the issue of supplies. Whether using airdrops or flights, Personnel of the 1st Parachute Supply Regiment and the Air Force worked tirelessly around the clock to prepare and transport food, munitions and equipment to the front lines in order to ensure the success of the mission. Four days later, the presidents of France and Mali met in Timbuktu. You have conducted operations You conducted operations with such expertise it was an admirable exploit. I'm particularly impressed by the airdrop operation here at the Timbuktu airport. The French president took advantage of a few minutes in private conversation with military leaders to confirm his orders. The rebels must be found and destroyed. At the same time, in Senegal, French contingents from Toulon arrived in Dakar. After a 2,500-kilometer journey across two countries, soldiers of GTIA No. 2 arrived in Bamako. Infantrymen and Navy infantry soldiers were eager to see action, but Bamako was just a stopover point. They were given just 24 hours to be combat ready and travel to Gao. They were joined there by GTIA 3, which had left Niger by road. Meanwhile, the hunt continued and the pace speeded up. Paratroopers of the 1st RCP joined the 1,000 Chadian soldiers already present in the town of Kidal, but then they needed to push further north. Preceded by special forces, roughly 50 paratroopers thus carried out their third assault landing during their mission after being dropped on the village of Tesalit. Then on the morning of the 8th of February, a contingent from GTIA 3 entered the village after a three-day march from Gao. The next day, hussars from the 1st RHP seized the town of Menaka in the middle of the rebel-controlled zone and were quickly reinforced by men from the 126th Infantry Regiment. For the operations to be successful, command resources of the Serval Brigade followed the pace of the units and the progress of operational maneuvers. As soon as it touched down on Malian soil, the command station of the 3rd Mechanized Brigade was set up in Bamako where it took on the combined role of Brigade Command Station and Command Center for the Army Contingent. On the 24th of January, a so-called Forward Command Station was moved to the town of Sevare, where operations were commanded for the seizure of Timbuktu. It was installed on the 28th of January. 24 hours after Gao was taken, Command Station G08 of the 11th Airborne Brigade was set up in the city. 
Meanwhile, the main command station prepared for its transfer to Gao. On the 12th of February, command station G08 was transported by air to Tesselit in order to take over occasional command of operations in the Adra. Twelve days later, the main command station sent officer reinforcements from the staff headquarters to command operations in the north. The difficult maneuvers involved in moving command resources took place under the orders of Colonel Minjula Ray, who methodically and boldly oversaw the meticulous work. However, the most important aspect of command mobility was to maintain and never break active lines of communication between the various entities, no matter what the circumstances, even when separated by up to 1,200 kilometers. The transmission operators of the 3rd Command and Transmission Company met this challenge. Throughout the entire campaign, the command and transmission companies of the 3rd and 11th Brigades worked tirelessly with the forward command staff to ensure that those commanding combat units were given the capability to do so with the assistance of the 28th Transmission Regiment Group and Airborne Command Station of the 53rd. The same day in Gao, a terrorist suicide bomber blew himself up, killing a Malian soldier. On the 10th of February, rebels infiltrated the city and holed themselves up in the police station. Heavy fighting took place in the entire neighborhood, particularly where Western journalists were staying. During the operation, for the first time in the conflict, two soldiers from the brigade were wounded and received immediate care. Two decisions were therefore made to loosen the pressure of the rebels on the force the launch of Operation Hérisson with the goal of extending the security perimeter around French bases and the launch of Operation Python in the region of Bourem. This town is an important road junction not yet reached by French forces. On this occasion, the 92nd RI and its armored vehicles for infantry combat were on the front line. The town was reached within 48 hours and for the first time, French soldiers of the Auvergne regiment savored the warm welcome of the local population. The locals gave us a wonderful warm welcome and were happy to see us and feel freed from the constraints they were under. We also engaged in extremely constructive and interesting dialogue with these populations and their various representatives. Around the town, French soldiers began a meticulous search of the surrounding wooded area. So we found six Russian 122mm shells that had been tampered with. In other words, the triggering system had been replaced by an electric detonator and a gas cylinder that had also been tampered with. It's easy to imagine that this weapon could have been used as an improvised explosive device or as a human bomb. Munitions were immediately destroyed by marine combat engineers of the 6th Engineer Regiment. This massif is reputed to be a sanctuary enemy. Il y a two jours, it was ticket au sud de ces positions là. GCP. In Tessalit, another major operation began. To drive out rebels hiding in their natural fortress, the Iforas Massif. Reconnaissance was conducted near the mountain massif by armored vehicles and paratroopers of GTIA No. 4, who'd arrived in Tessalit in the meantime. These operations were carried out under the name Operation Panther. As usual, the enemy remained in hiding. However, the presence of bivouacs, various weapons and suspicious people in the area hinted at future attacks. In the early hours of the 19th of February, paratrooper commandos came under enemy fire in the Amitetai Valley. Staff Sergeant Harold Vormazel of the 2nd Foreign Parachute Regiment was fatally wounded.
tanks of the 1st Rima, supported by Tiger helicopters of the GAM, fired back with precision on rebel positions, reducing them to silence. The tone was given. Terrorists were indeed in the massif and ready to fight to the finish. L'objectif pour le moment c'est d'arriver entier, complet, sans panne, sans casse, sans, sans loose topo, dans la région d'Anefis ce soir, de prendre les ordres et ensuite de relancer l'action là où le général décidera de nous envoyer. The brigade therefore reorganized without leaving the rebels time to catch their breath. While paratroopers of the 1st RCP arrived to provide GTIA No. 4 with reinforcement, GTIA No. 3 headed north. For the Serval command, the objective was clear. The Massif, nicknamed the Donjon, or Keep, had to fall. On the 21st of February, the situation in Gao suddenly changed when some 20 kamikazes entered the city and engaged in fighting with the Malian forces of Colonel Major Dako. GTIA No. 2, with armoured vehicles for infantry combat of the 92nd RI, was sent to the city centre and the combat zone. To break through the thick walls of the building where terrorists were holed up, French soldiers fired shots with the Erix missile launcher and AT-4 rocket launcher. After several hours of fighting, the situation seemed to calm down. We're in line, in column, the long of the car. Okay? Appui mutuel, on se mettra en ligne le long du muret là-bas sur la gauche. Okay? Allez, en avant. But it was still dangerous. A man on a motorcycle was shot when he attempted to blow up a bomb in the middle of the French lines. Combat engineers immediately neutralized the bomb he was wearing. Maintenant, c'est quoi exactement? Regardez, ça, c'est l'explosif artisanal avec des billes. Ça, c'est l'explosif fondu militaire. Et puis ça, j'imagine qu'il y a. Quoi? Despite some fighting in the afternoon, the battle was won. We're really maintaining a 360 degree security system because we can't be sure of anything. To do so, we rely on intelligence provided by the Malians. Roughly 20 rebels were killed and eight soldiers were injured in the Franco Malian ranks. The enemy had suffered a major defeat. But would it be enough to shake their determination? While the French worked in the west, Chadians arrived to face deadly fighting against rebels in the east. In just one day, 26 Chadian forces were killed and 68 wounded. They received care from French medical personnel. Vous, vous allez avec le premier CP. Au fur et à mesure, ils nous basculeront des patients dans la tente. OK. C'est ceux qui ont besoin d'un avis. D'accord, on a la première tente. Et on se remet Hop, un coup. Throughout the night, helicopters from the Air Mobile Group transported the wounded. The Mascal plan, used in the event of mass casualties, was implemented. That night and the next day were the darkest of Operation Serval. 
leaving a lasting impression on all those who were fighting. Medical service personnel were particularly affected as they tirelessly cared for the wounded. In spite of their losses, France's allies did not disappoint. 90 terrorists were killed and 23 taken prisoner. The force reacted immediately. Major General Barrera traveled to the North Command Station in Tesselet and was welcomed by Colonels Van den Est and de Berthier. An operation that would become one of the largest missions carried out by the Serval Brigade was on the verge of commencing. Donc ce briefing est centré sur Panther 3. Vous avez ici les chefs de corps en première ligne, donc Demol, Boujon et Egou. Nothing was left to chance. Extensive reconnaissance was conducted. 1600, c'est le plus gros. Et le verrou nord, il est derrière la tâche qu'on a au plus près. The various units positioned themselves around the massif, ready to pounce on the rebels. While two contingents pushed the rebels to the center of the valley with GTIA No. 3 to the west and armed Chadian forces under the command of Generals Bikimo and Debi to the east, GTIA No. 4 worked its way over the northern ridges on foot. On the morning of the 26th of February, all units engaged in battle. To the east, Chadian forces were immediately attacked. To the west, Marine infantry soldiers also entered the valley in the early morning. Fighting began in the early afternoon. Chacun se déplace. Chacun se déplace. The enemy was well entrenched and bullets began whizzing past French soldiers. The order was given for mortar and two Caesar cannons that had just been deployed after a 500 kilometer journey to fire a round of 12 shells on rebel positions. The Marine artillery of the 11th Rama hit their targets, but fighting continued. The enemy remained well hidden in the vegetation covering the valley. Fighter aircraft dropped 250 kilogram GBU bombs on terrorist positions. The western stronghold of Ametetai fell in three days. During the maneuver, the use of the latest generation in equipment facilitated artillery, helicopter and aviation fire support. Digital technology was used on the battlefield to transfer information more quickly between the front lines and command stations and increase efficiency in maneuvering, identifying and destroying enemy targets. In the north, paratroopers also joined the assault. In stifling heat of well over 40 degrees Celsius with up to 60 kilograms of equipment on their backs, soldiers walked all day in what they would end up calling the hell of Iforas. Nights in the desert are cold with considerable differences in temperature. After a short night of rest, the men continued their difficult task at dawn. They moved ahead slowly as each rock was a potential hiding place for a combat position. And the enemy was there. 
Legionnaires found a series of combat positions hidden in the rocky peaks. Armoured vehicles, artillery, helicopters and Air Force fighters destroyed them. A few kilometres from there, paratroopers of the 1st RCP moved forward parallel to the Legionnaires. The 28th of February and the 1st of March played out the same way. Negative. L'ennemi is at 50 meters, he se déplace devant uh, mon dispositif. In stifling heat, infantry companies destroyed rebel positions one after another. Pour l'instant, j'attaque en déplacement pour trouver bonne position. Ouais, Sira, bien pris. Concernant la situation du blessé, il est en train d'être évacué vers l'arrière. A little earlier, a legionnaire was injured during the fighting. A bullet ricocheted against his telescopic sight. On the 2nd of March, paratroopers were close to reaching their objective, but they found themselves in front of a rocky peak which formed a natural bunker. Est-ce que tu vois des mouvements au niveau de l'impact? Inside, a group of rebels were well entrenched. For seven hours, the force fired from all sides in a fine display of joint forces combat. During the assault, a paratrooper of the 1st RCP was killed and his comrades brought back his body. Master Corporal Cédric Charenton became the second soldier to lose his life in the hell of Iferas. The brigade was deeply affected by these deaths, but the fight had to go on and the soldiers continued with unwavering determination. From the beginning of fighting, combat engineers tirelessly scoured the landscape for rebel combat positions. Here we just recovered six RPG-7 rockets from the different combat positions that we seized. That's why we're going to destroy them, so that they can't fall back into the hands of the jihadists. Finally, on the 3rd of March, French soldiers reached the valley and entered the village of Amatetai. And they made some interesting discoveries. For the moment, we found various weapon caches in different buildings. We found vehicles, quite a few weapons, a lot of explosives and a lot of materials for preparing improvised explosive devices. At midday, they met up with Chadian soldiers. Terrorists were still holed up in the Iferas Massif, but by the evening of the same day, Serval soldiers were able to say that the donjon had fallen. On the 7th of March, the French Minister of Defence, Jean-Yves Le Drian, arrived in the Ametetai Valley to meet Colonel Demeul's men. I'm not sure that we measured, that France measured, the scope of the hidden arsenal scattered throughout Mali to support an international jihadist movement. 
Despite the significant efforts made in the Iforas Massif, operations continued in Gao. The village of Kaji, five kilometers from the city, was suspected of harboring a large number of rebels. The problem was that the village is on an island. The solution came from the 31st Engineering Regiment and its divers. After an 18 kilometer infiltration on boats, French soldiers reached the island. There, 20 suspects were arrested during the operation. For GTIA 2, it was the beginning of a series of operations aimed at destroying rebel groups still present in the wadis northeast of Gao, under the code name Doro. While guns of the 68th African Artillery Regiment, helicopters of the GAM and fighter aircraft pummeled rebel positions, soldiers of the GTIA 2 and Malian Army took part in extremely violent clashes. Some of these ended with grenades and close-range handgun fighting. For the brigade, Doro had a significant outcome. More than 150 terrorists were eliminated from combat. But on the 6th of March, Master Corporal Wilfried Pango of the 68th African Artillery Regiment was fatally wounded in Inraoi. He became the third of the brigade to lose his life. That night, in the presence of General Dembele, his comrades paid their last respects before his body was placed in a Transal aircraft alongside a Malian soldier who'd been killed the same day. At the same time, in the north, part of GTIA No. 3 and No. 4 returned to Tesalit to give the men a rest and take care of equipment after ten gruelling days of fighting during the Battle of Amitetai. Weapons were cleaned and soldiers took the time to erase the external marks of the week spent in the field. Vehicles were also put to the test during the fighting, so mechanics were brought in from Bamako to work on them round the clock to have the brigade fully ready for the next battle. Everyone enjoyed a short time to relax, relieve some stress and try to clear their minds of the visions of death and wounded soldiers being evacuated. But the enemy was still hiding in the Iforas Massif, and particularly in the Terz and Asamalmal valleys near the Amatetai Valley. For the soldiers of GTIA No. 3 and No. 4, it meant that they would have to return to the Badlands. They progressed at a slow and exhausting pace, with the heat also becoming their enemy. But the rebels gradually began to give up. Efforts were concentrated on water sources, where terrorists were forced to come to replenish their water supply. Numerous weapons caches were found. They had to advance cautiously because of the risk of mines and improvised explosive devices, or IEDs. One of them exploded under the AMX 10RC of Corporal Van Doren of the 1st Reamer. The brigade lost its fourth soldier. Operations nevertheless continued around the Iforas Massif, particularly in the east. General Bikimo's Chadian forces and the Serval Brigade continued to work in cooperation on a daily basis, and coordinated reconnaissance operations were led in the town of Abe Bara. While the situation in the Iforas Massif seemed to be calming down, 
there was a surge in violence in the Niger Bend region. On the 22nd of March, the enemy attempted to take back its hold of Timbuktu. Deuxième partie, les autorités. Ensuite, il y a une cuisine et la piscine. Les famas sont huit. Ils sont répartis sur cet axe-là. D'accord. L'ennemi est situé en en coordonnées. Once again, the rebels' endeavor ended in failure thanks to the intervention of French Marines and Gaulois of GTIA No. 2. Four days later, in Gao, rebels were once again present. The 92nd RI intervened again, but this time providing support to Malian soldiers on the front line. Passing the torch on to the Malian military was consistent with the withdrawal of the first French units to leave Mali. However, the areas northeast of Gao had to be secured as quickly as possible. On the morning of the 6th of April, Operation Gustave began. With a careful search of the entire desert. The first surprise came when French soldiers found a cache of 18 aviation bombs. They were immediately destroyed. This surprising find would not be the last. Serval men also found a diesel fuel supply depot. And later, a carefully camouflaged generator set in the ground. The enemy had just lost an important portion of its logistics, but remained in hiding. Gustave was one of 50 operations carried out by the brigade. Their outcome was significant. More than 200 tons of munitions were discovered and destroyed. Roughly 50 vehicles were neutralized and several hundred terrorists killed. Serval therefore increased its pressure on the rebels and operations were launched in every direction. On the 2nd of April, armored reconnaissance was conducted near the village of Arawan, 250 kilometers north of Timbuktu. The vehicles suffered and often got stuck in the sand dunes, but they reached the village. The welcome they received from the nomads left a lasting impression on the column that completed the trek. However, it would soon be time for the Serval Brigade to leave. GTIA 3 and 4 had already been replaced. Convoys began bringing equipment back to the north. Over four months under the command of Colonel Velu, the 511th Supply Regiment traveled back and forth over long distances in the worst possible conditions. Meeting every challenge put before them, the regiment rose constantly to the occasion. The soldiers of the brigade had one last mission to fulfill. To put the equipment in order, clean up and step aside for those replacing them. Preparations had to be made to transfer authority to the Malian military and rebuild the country. Operation Serval continued until July 2014, replaced by Operation Barkhane, with the geographic range going beyond Mali from Mauritania to Chad. The brigade had fulfilled its mission. For four months, the soldiers of Operation Serval fought and went through hardships together in Mali. Fighting fanatics prepared to go to any lengths 
This brigade, a concentrated version of the French army, fulfilled all its missions with professionalism and courage and sometimes making the ultimate sacrifice. Guided by the small victory of Constantine, the Africans of the Third remained loyal to those who had fought before them in 1944, traveling in the opposite direction to liberate occupied France under the orders of General de Montsabert. Seventy years later, the men and women of the brigade are able to march with their heads held high as they parade down the Champs-Élysées. They met the same challenge with a single goal, victory. <laughs>